Um, first of all, I just want to thank you for joining us today as we talk about preventing commercial displacement near transit. Very excited about the webinar we have today. Have a lot of great folks on the line that are going to share some insights with us. Um, before we dive in, I just wanted to give a brief overview of the Toolbox series. Um, so this is a quarterly webinar series that's hosted by the Puget Sound Regional Council. My name is Katie Enders, and I'm an associate planner here on our regional planning team. And our goal for this webinar series is really to bring together best practices and resources for local planning, essentially giving you as a planner, hopefully another tool in your toolbox to use to address, um, you know, different concerns and opportunities we have in our region. Few logistics for today. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to the agency's YouTube channel within a week or so. And we'll also share all of these great presentations you'll be seeing today. Um, you'll notice that this is a Zoom webinar. And so although you don't have a chat function, you do have a, a Q&A option. So we really encourage you to ask questions in the Q&A as the presentations go on. I'll be hopping in to introduce um, like each next speaker, and I'll take a couple of moments to ask some Q&A questions to the folks that are wrapping up. So go ahead and ask those questions. If you are looking for an AICP credit, you'll be eligible for that, and I'll have more information at the end of the webinar. And finally, we have a session evaluation and a Title VI survey at the end of this that we do appreciate if you take the time to fill out. A couple of things I wanted to highlight. Um, Coming up, this is not a PSRC affiliated event, but the University of Washington next Thursday is hosting um, a very similar uh, conversation, different speakers, which will be great. They're gonna have some folks from Sound Transit and LISC, if you're familiar, as well as a community-based organization. So we've just dropped a link for that. If you are in the Seattle area, it's an in-person event. And then on the toolbox agenda, starting in February, we are going to host a PSRC data session. So this is gonna be a really exciting time for PSRC's great data staff to share and even do some demos of ways that you as planners in our region can use the great data resources that we have available at PSRC. So we hope to see you there. As far as today goes, um, after I'm done talking, I'm going to quickly hand it off to Liz, my colleague from PSRC, to introduce the topic. Then we'll be hearing from staff at the City of Redmond, Philly Marsh, and Becky Fry. After that, a great presentation from Heidi Hall at the City of Seattle and Tony Stinnett with Grow America. And then we'll be wrapping up with Warner Cook and Donald Jackson joining us from the City of Austin down in Texas. And then we'll save a couple of minutes at the end for any other Q&A questions. We got a lot that were submitted before the session as well. So I have a list of those. And with that, I will pass it over to Liz to get us started. Great, thank you so much, Katie. Um, I just wanted to do a brief introduction. Um, over the last few years, uh, we've done kind of an annual uh, event focused on equitable TOD. Um, that's been in person at, at times. And this year we're doing kind of a two-part webinar series. So uh, we had a webinar back in September that focused more on uh, community connections uh, and amenities near transit. So we recorded that session if you're interested um, back in September. Um, but we've also heard a lot of interest as part of our TOD work and thinking more about the role of commercial displacement. Um, there's certainly been a lot of focus on residential displacement as part of the comprehensive plan updates. I think there are also a lot of questions about uh, what opportunities there are for cities um, and other jurisdictions to think about um, affordable commercial spaces, the role of um, small and locally owned businesses, and preserving opportunities for those uh, types of businesses uh, near transit, but also in other parts of your community. So uh, we're really excited today. We really appreciate that so many of you are able to join us. Um, and so I just wanted to hand it off to uh, the City of Redmond staff, um, Philly and Becky. So much, and um, I'll go ahead and get started here. 
Um, my name is Philly Marsh. I'm the Economic Development Manager for the City of Redmond. Um, I've been uh, practicing economic development here on Seattle or Seattle's east side um, for over a decade. And I'm really excited to be having this conversation um, because it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. And I think the more we share and learn from each other, the better outcomes we'll have for our region. Um, Fun fact here, as I also am trying to figure out how to turn on my video, um, is this picture is actually from our first set of light rail openings uh, in Redmond last April. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to Becky to introduce herself. Uh, good morning. I'm sorry, my camera's not working today. Um, I'm Becky Fry. I'm the principal planner from the Long Range Planning Division of the City of Redmond. I'm leading uh, one of the project managers for Redmond 2050. I've been leading a lot of the work um, jointly with Philly on our commercial displacement and just small business support. And, and I'll share a lot of that work a little bit later. Uh, but I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. Let's see. So just to get us started from a context standpoint, um, Redmond 2050 is a major update for our community. Um, it's the first really major update since we adopted our first comp plan 30 years ago. Uh, but it's also really significant because we are making the transition from a suburb to a city. Um, that includes every single standard that we're doing is switching from suburban standards to urban. Um, including going from the campus style business office development to a lot of more urban TOD mixed use. We're adding 25,000 housing units and 30,000 jobs in this planning period, opening four new light rail stations um, and all sorts of work that goes along with that. And around two of the light rail stations in particular, it's a complete wipe and rebuild um, just because of the scale of growth that's happening. Um, but there's a lot of other things that are happening um, as we do this transition over the last uh, dozen years or so. Um, we have been seeing a loss of our retail space and just expenses, uh, costs of spaces have been going up no matter what, no matter where you are. Uh, but as we wipe those old one story uh, commercial buildings are being replaced with um, five over one or five over two, where it's just tokenized retail on the first floor. And so there's a lot of loss of space that's happening right now. Um, so combining with that loss, the rising costs and the actual complete wipe and rebuild of two of our station areas, uh, this is a really uh, important topic for our community. So as we were going through all of this, just in general, our community identified um, equity and inclusion, sustainability, resiliency, how do we be a welcoming community just in general, uh, that affordability and displacement for housing and commercial both. Uh, and to be honest, in our community, it's not really a housing displacement issue. Uh, what is happening is older malls and older manufacturing areas older like those strip mall those are the things that are getting rebuilt so it's really a commercial displacement conversation for our community um, and accessibility in general we need to maintain the fact that we are a regional hub for a lot of those services our retail big box area serves as a regional function not just a local function and then just how do we do our centers how do we make vibrant neighborhoods and we've been having a lot of that conversation about that complete neighborhoods, getting people access to services closer to homes, not having just straight up single family zoning districts. So that's just our context. I'll hand it back over to Philly. And um, as we start talking about a journey, I think it's just really important to realize there's no one size fits all solution to this problem. Um, our region is unique to the rest of the country. And even all of our cities within this region have different um, dynamics and challenges and therefore will have different paths to solutions. So we thought we would share 
um, and the framework we've started to put together and think through as we examine our problem as we're learning from other programs and trying to build appropriate solutions to meet um, our unique needs in Redmond. Um, first is just looking at your market and understanding your market dynamics. So why are businesses being displaced? Is it because of market price inflation or is it because you're having um, redevelopment um, occur? And um, also, is this something that's kind of just starting to happen or you see on the horizon or kind of are you in the middle or kind of towards the end of it? And depending on those answers, um, you'll probably have different tools uh, that are available to use and kind of build or think about. Um, another thing is just thinking about what your community wants are and what will be supportive from a market perspective. Um, probably the consideration we've spent the most amount of time kind of diving into is the consideration um, of the words we choose to describe the problem. Um, so even with, you know, anti-displacement, is that the right word when we know that um, we have to um, to basically redevelop. So a lot of times when in kind of national context, when um, anti-displacement is used, people jump to preservation of space. And we know that that's kind of in, in conflict with the redevelopment that needs to happen for affordable housing goals. So trying to get really specific and, you know, use words such as displacement mitigation or um, retention of businesses that have been displaced. Also, when we talk about business, um, getting a, a pretty specific about it. So I think even the title of this is commercial displacement. Well, commercial can also mean office. So is that something that you're trying to solve for too, or is it more on retail? And when you say retail, do people understand it? That's also means restaurants and services. Um, do you have a need to define active retail different from general retail? Um, if you're seeing that a lot of the ground floor spaces are maybe being filled by dentist offices or banks, um, can you dive a little bit detail uh, deeper and be more specific about what you are wanting to see or support in the spaces? Uh, you build. And then um, we, you know, we talk about small business and small business is often measured by a number of jobs, but are we really looking to build um, space for small businesses and how do you define that? Um, the next one um, is, you know, you are what you measure. So what are you measuring in your city and what aren't you measuring? And then if you start measuring that, what do you find? Um, we have great targets and tracking of affordable housing. Um, and we often track, um, you know, jobs um, by business licenses, but are we also tracking it by brick and mortar square footage or number of shops that we have? Uh, in Redmond, we actually went back and uh, tracked the last 10 years of development and discovered there was a significant reduction in the amount of retail square footage, um, which Becky uh, mentioned. Um, and so really, how are you defining your needs, setting targets, and um, continuing to measure and report out on that? Um, money, you, you know, there's someone has to pay for it. You know, it can be the business, uh, free market, let the businesses figure out. But how are you tracking and uh, what's the trend and if that's working or not? Um, we're hearing from our community that they want these small legacy businesses. But unfortunately, they aren't able to compete in the free market. Um, the city could potentially have a role, but we do have a gift of public funds challenges or challenge in the state. So um, how are we defining public benefit um, and a policy for small business support? Um, the city could indirectly um, support through incentives. Um, and Becky's going to talk a little bit more about that and how we kind of balance that against some other um, city values um, of what we want to do with our incentives. And then, of course, the developer, but what are they getting in return um, and what's that opportunity cost? Um, and then the last one, which we've kind of started to dig a little bit into is just the motivation of the development community. So, um, you know, are they looking, is their intention to sell the building and they're going to approach retail much differently uh, probably than if they're looking to hold on to that, that building and kind of be a staple within the community. Um, so 
uh, those are just kind of the kind of five things we've really started to build a framework around and start asking a lot of questions around as we start to discover um, what tools we will use and build for our um, our city. So we started really with having a lot of conversations in our community. Um, this happened from multiple di different venues, um, but it really heavily dive into it with our early work with the community in 2020 and 2021 as we kicked off our Redmond 2050 work. And here's just some quotes that we heard from some of our small businesses outreach. Our, uh, we did some very specific uh, language-based outreach to businesses that we knew were going to be displaced, especially around the light rail stations. Um, and so their concerns were balanced by excitement. So they, they really did think that the light rail coming, that the redevelopment that was happening was really going to benefit them. The improved walkability was going to be great. But there was a lot of concern, even without the redevelopment, that there were issues with costs, as we mentioned. So just these are just sharing what we heard, but the, the gist of it was we had to have a lot of conversations really early on so that we could understand, as Philly was mentioning, that without that understanding of what the, our businesses were facing and what their specific unique needs were and understanding what their costs were, uh, we couldn't identify pathways to move forward. After listening to our community, that's when we could start building our toolbox. Um, and these are a, a few of those tools we're going to go over today, um, really starting with intentional aligned planning, um, but looking at kind of district development around our TODs, um, and then how we can build the development incentives, um, always be open to creative opportunities, and of course, the business support that we have for our businesses. Um, so starting with collaboration and planning, you know, as we started to hear from our uh, community, we soon realized that um, this was not a one division or department solution, and we really had to come together to have a cross section of um, subject matter expertise to um, to pitch in and help with an adaptive solution. And most importantly was that planning and economic development worked really closely together. Um, Becky and I have weekly conversations on this topic and kind of what she's hearing, how that might look from a policy perspective, a code perspective, and then um, how that would turn into an economic development implementation, program implementation. Um, so I um, definitely recommend kind of finding your friends um, in this cross-sectional um, a solution. Um, but we also learned just how important it was to kind of define the problem and educate internal departments on um, what we were trying to solve for um, as we brought different ideas or proposals forward. Um, you know, some illustrations of how we work together is again, going back to that definition, how are we describing and what is the interpretation of the different words we're using um, and how does that look like when it's written in code. Um, and then also understanding the limitations of some of the policy codes and plans um, and seeing how it might within it or where there, where there might be some conflict that we can um, uh, realize and then try to work forward uh, in the future. Um, so knowing that our solutions may have inclusion or impact on other plans, um, most particularly what we found is probably sustainability as we start talking about, you know, uh, transit-oriented developments and 10, 15-minute cities, and then also parks and being able to utilize some public space for um, small business support. So um, just creating more of that awareness and through line for effective implementation. So some of the work that we did, we're going to start sharing just some specific examples. And it's very unique to our community. We just created opportunities that were seeded by thoughts that came from the community. So we had the opportunity to start looking at districts. And the first implementation of that are going to be two cultural districts around two of our light rail stations. It fits very strongly with our community values for understanding those places and spaces that people love. And also, these are the places that are 
the most prone to redevelopment and the most sensitive businesses that need the, the most help. So part of that is just creating space for identifying how important they are to our community. And that gives us a basis to then establish incentives and programs and all sorts of different tools that we could build upon that. So uh, two districts are going to be uh, implemented. First is the Overlake Intercultural District, and the second one will be at Marymore Village. Uh, it's an arts and cultural district and inclusive neighborhood. Uh, the other huge piece that's moving forward is a brand new incentive program. The city is just ditching our old system entirely going to a new really extensive program that's a, more of a menu of options. The more you do, the more you get, uh, very stackable. Um, it is really heavily focused around our light rail stations, but it is, um, we're expanding it citywide. And in the past, we've really focused a lot of our incentives on you know, affordable housing or green building. Uh, a couple of other major community benefits, like a major park or something along those lines. We're moving forward with a lot more focus on equity. There's a huge focus on anti-displacement um, and really had a lot of conversations built in with our academic development folks, with our small business owners, with our diverse community in mind uh, and their specific needs. And we've recognizing that the market right now is in particularly sensitive we've heard a lot about the market being very very difficult how can we really make that first reuse of kicking off this program just even of a higher benefit to help fast track the implementation of that and so what that looks like um, is a lot on this next slide here and I'm not going to read through this, but you can see there's lots of different categories as we're trying to tackle this. There are some very specific anti-displacement assistance programming, um, business relocation, trying to pair uh, businesses that are being relocated with the new construction, relocation packaging, right of first refusal. Uh, but to be honest, those were considered hard to implement in many places. So we really found that we needed a lot more. So it wasn't just displacement assistance per se at a very strict standpoint. It was how can we make it cost less? So we're looking at those shell enhancements. Can we make it to where moving into those new buildings is less expensive? Can we do affordable spaces and small business spaces? Can we do co-location agreements with the businesses that are really struggling hard to find affordable spaces? Because new construction is more expensive than the older places that they're moving out of. And then pairing that also with our cultural district incentives, um, very specific needs that are extremely expensive, inclusionary design features and arts and culture features too. And so this is just one snapshot of a really big program. Um, but the goal then is to make sure that these spaces that are being built can accommodate the businesses that are having to move. And that's been the huge challenge um, because our traditional redevelopment and the traditional mixed use sometimes doesn't even have the clearance, ceiling height clearance to meet the needs of businesses that are, or the sizes are wrong, or including the depth. And it's just not building to the needs of the people that are having to move. And so the, a lot of the goals around the incentive program is just trying to make those spaces and places fit the needs spatially and affordability wise for our community. Um, and then what we also are going to do in order to make those incentives work and support kind of the, the success of them is um, developing some um, support for our developers. Um, what we've learned, and it was through some conversations with our retail brokers in our community, um, and I definitely encourage to um, have conversations with your brokers because they were really candid about their experience working with developers, especially our kind of housing focused developers, and it's sharing that there can be a lack of retail understanding with these housing developers, um, which results in retail being somewhat of an afterthought. Um, so you know what we were seeing like whatever was the easiest to produce kind of these big open floor plates with no thought to retail infrastructure needed um things like a cooking hood or kind of restroom layout etc um 
things that are much easier to proactively plan for before the building is built than to retrofit after um, the case uh, weren't being planned out. So how can we provide more support to our developers um, and whether that be market data to show what the potential of different retail establishments are within the city. We're gonna be getting place our AI um, and be able to share some of that. Um, is there a way to kind of do that retail kind of one, one-on-one -on -one education um, and kind of get, uh, be able to provide some of that upfront considerations for our development community? Um, and then some of what Becky mentioned, we, we will be having displaced businesses. So how can we pair those businesses we know are in the path of redevelopment and displacement with our newer developments um, to be able to kind of adopt them as they're taking advantage of some of these um, incentives that we have to offer? We've also been exploring other ways that we could ease things. And this could be any idea that's floating from anywhere. Um, how do we take advantage of the fact that we are already opening up our codes, redeveloping uh, our zoning code from the ground up? How can we change what we're doing to remove barriers or provide ways that are unique pathways, speed, implementation of new ideas. So these are just a couple of examples of just creative opportunities. We're moving away from single use zones entirely. We're not gonna, we're gonna have a single family, but we're also not gonna have commercial only zones anymore. Um, we're going to basically every zone has some type of mixed use in it, um, but also some of our large uh, mixed use zones, especially where we have our regional retail, which is our big box district, um, as we transition to mixed use zones, we do not want it to be mostly housing over tokenized retail. We have to keep those large stores. We have to keep that function in our community. We don't want to lose that. Um, so we're adopting no net loss into our urban mixed use zone, which is our largest mixed use zone, uh, to maintain the spatial requirements. And we're creating unique opportunities and guidelines around what the zoning district will be. Um, we're adopting a brand new neighborhood mixed use zone and we're easing up requirements um, in our neighborhoods to offer more spaces and places and opportunities, especially for those small businesses. Um, this is really important because mixed use building types don't work for every business type, um, and especially those smaller um, homegrown businesses if they have opportunities for smaller buildings within an existing home, even without a major remodel, um, that Complete Neighborhoods offers new places for them to choose. Uh, we're also adopting a food truck and pop-up retail court as a new use. Uh, this will allow not just food truck courts, but those pop-up retail spaces uh, to co-locate and, and exist in multiple places in our community. Um, accessory commercial, this is right now an allowance specifically for displaced businesses that if you cannot find a place in a zone that allows your use, uh, if you're being displaced, it allows you to pair up with an existing business that might have extra space that they can't use. Uh, we have an example um, that Philly might, if she has time, might be able to walk through a little bit later. Um, and then, as Philly said, that matchmaking opportunity. So trying to create programming so that we early identify who's going to be having to move in two years. And can we pair you specifically with a developer so that they can design that space for you? Um, and that as you need to move, you only need to move once. You move into your new spot because obviously our small businesses, if they move once, it's really expensive. If we need to keep them in the community, moving once works best, and then moving twice to get back into their neighborhood is almost impossible. All right, we got the two minute warning here. So um, in Redmond, again, we're pro trying to proactively identify and support businesses that will need to relocate. 
um, and matching that business with the right assistance that's going to uh, meet their unique needs. We do have a very robust uh, business assistance ecosystem here in the region, but I think um, what's important to note is um, there's kind of three main things that are needed in order for this ecosystem to help. One, we need to make sure there's supply of retail so we can offer businesses all the assistance in the world, but if they can't find a spot, um, they're not going to um, be successful. Um, and then access to capital um, is a, a big need, especially for our local small diverse businesses who are often having to compete or meet certain criteria of the development for their credit worthiness. Um, and then uh, assistance on lease negotiation. So, um, you know, how can um, some of our smaller businesses um, be able to find leases that are maybe three years versus 10 to, or five to 10 years, which is um, standard. Um, so a lot of business support, definitely encourage you to reach out to your economic development um, or kind of business relations team um, with that, but there are some kind of uh, larger challenges that we need to address uh, to, to support this ecosystem and the small businesses. Um, really quickly, here's just some case studies. We'll make sure that we add links to all of these, but um, some the Together Center in Redmond is often mentioned as a model. I think just important to note um, that concept started in the 1990s and they purchased the land for $1.6 million. Um, it's something that's not available um, in the today's Redmond, um, but kind of a variation on a theme is the Overlake TOD. Um, where the um, winning proposal has a built-in 10,000 square foot uh, ground floor space kind of condo um, for business assistance providers um, to provide incubation space and pop-up retail space. So we're definitely excited um, and uh, hoping to see the success of that uh, for other additional models. Um, Redmond was one of eight cities who participated in HUD's Thriving Communities Technical Assistance, where um, we had national experts come in, look at what's happening here around our transit-oriented developments with both housing and commercial displacement um, and provide some opportunities for us to continue to evaluate. Um, shop small promotions um, are a great way to bring awareness and business to the small businesses in your community. You're going to be hearing from the Business Community Ownership Fund next, but a great resource. So I wanted to add that there. And then um, we recently joined the Small Business Anti-Displacement Network. This is out of, um, I believe, the University of Maryland. Um, but we've already had great conversations um, with um, places around the nation on kind of the challenges they're facing and how they we might be able to adapt them to our um, particular needs. And they do have a... Um, webinar or summit coming up here on November 14th around community ownership, um, which is something that Redmond is uh, interested in kind of learning more and evaluating how we might be able to foster some business or community ownership type models. And then last but not least, Becky. So if you haven't heard the Incremental Development Alliance, I would recommend you looking through that. It is one way that uh, it provides assistance and training for small businesses who really want to own their own space. How do they learn how to be those small developers and to develop their own spaces? So it's a great uh, opportunity if you're looking for small business ownership training um, and support for that model. Awesome. Well, thank you so much to both of you. This was super informative and really appreciate it. We do have some great questions in the Q&A, but I think um, in the interest of time for now, we're going to go ahead and transition to the city of Seattle and Grow America. But Philly and Becky, if either of you want to jump in the Q&A and type out some answers, feel free. And if not, we'll be wrapping some of these questions into our Q&A at the end of the session. So for now, we'll go ahead and pass it over to Heidi and Tony. And yeah, thanks again, Redmond. Great. 
Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate being part of this conversation and, and just learning from my fellow presenters. Uh, so my name is Heidi Hall. I manage the community wealth building team at the Seattle Office of Economic Development. And I'm joined today by my partner, Tony Stinnett, who's the program manager with Grow America. And they've been a really critical partner for us as we are uh, working on some of our uh, work around business ownership for commercial space. So we'll talk about some strategies we're deploying in Seattle to address commercial affordability issues and commercial displacement. And then we'll go into more detail on a new investment model we are piloting for businesses to own their commercial spaces for long-term affordability. Um, so the Seattle office of, actually, Tony, one slide back. <laughs> Thanks. I'll just real quickly, the Seattle Office of uh, Economic Development, we're focused on building an inclusive economy, reducing the racial wealth gap, and encouraging innovation and growth. And in 2022, we worked with community stakeholders to develop the Future of Seattle Economy Framework, which outlines five strategic pillars that govern our investment strategies. So you'll see those there. Um, and then Grow America is a um, long, long established community and economic development nonprofit. They've got over 50 years uh, increasing the flow of capital for investments in low income communities and direct capital to support the development and preservation of affordable housing, creation of jobs through training and small business lending, and uh, advancement of livable communities through investment in social infrastructure. Um, and again, like I said, long history of working here in Seattle with the Office of Economic Development. Next slide. So with the community wealth uh, building team, we are working to close racial wealth gaps and interrupt displacement through economic development strategies rooted in community wealth building. Um, and so this approach really focuses on keeping wealth in communities with an emphasis on shared wealth and ownership of community assets. So we see business ownership as a path to generational wealth building, especially in our Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities. Um, and so we're doing this through several key strategies. And a lot of this work has been ongoing that we were able to scale up in recent years, um, partly in response to some of the pandemic and some of the federal recovery funds. Uh, so we're doing this through commercial affordability and ownership. So investing in a business's infrastructure for growth and sustainability and to help businesses stay in their neighborhoods or provide pathways for businesses to come back. Um, in Seattle, there has been a lot of displacement. So we're also working with communities and helping create those pathways. Um, access to affordable capital. I think the last presenter mentioned that is huge, uh, really supporting business ownership and growth to generate family wealth and address um, long-standing racial wealth gaps in access to capital. Um, and then building equitable business support systems. We've really scaled up a lot of business support programs to address systemic barriers, um, really try to shorten the road to profitability for small business. And I think any of these commercial space strategies we're finding, uh, it's really important to have those wraparound supports and services. Um, and then finally, community engagement and neighborhood partnerships. These strategies uh, represent over a decade of, of work with our, our community partners, our neighborhood business districts, small businesses. Um, we work directly with, you know, over you know, thousands of businesses during the pandemic response. And so really building on all of that and able to put some of these pieces in place. Um, and yeah, I'll go to the next slide. And I guess I'll say to um, I'll focus just briefly, given the topic of this on our commercial affordability work that we've been scaling up. And I would say, um, while these aren't TOD specific strategies, a lot of the new development is happening in TOD areas. So this is really uh, as we're thinking about business retention, commercial affordability, anchoring our neighboring neighboring businesses, a lot of these new developments are happening in TOD areas. So um, you know, really thinking about how we support businesses in some of these new mixed use developments, um, particularly in Seattle around like Chinatown ID, Rainier Valley, Mount Baker, Othello, Rainier Beach, um, neighborhoods that have, you know, had light rail and so on. Um, so here we've got multiple, we've been really thinking about building out a continuum of commercial affordability here in Seattle. So having multiple strategies to support businesses at different points in their journey. Um, and to support a range of community goals. Um, so I'll just touch briefly, Seattle Restored is one of the programs that was launched in the pandemic as a recovery response to address vacant storefronts. And that program is really continuing to evolve. Um, so it's been focused on downtown. We're now looking at, in addition to pop-ups, how do we support kind of that matchmaking component, really leveraging those relationships with property owners, that network of um, small business entrepreneurs and creative entrepreneurs, and also piloting expansion into our neighborhoods. 
Um, the tenant improvement program we had been piloting with our community development block grant funds and scaled that up quickly and have continued to evolve and redesign that to um, support businesses and neighborhoods. And then finally, the business community ownership fund, which is looking at long term ownership and control. So I will um, we'll be talking about that in more detail. And the one thing I'll flag here on the map, so C City of Seattle, and just a huge shout out to my colleagues at the Office of Planning and Community Development. They've we've really been looking at um, kind of access to opportunity metrics and um, and as a way to prioritize a lot of our investments, you'll see the racial and social equity priority areas, which have been historically um, underinvested neighborhoods. And that is where we are focusing a lot of our work around commercial affordability. Next slide. Oh, and just briefly, the um, tenant improvement program I mentioned is really looking at making initial tenancy costs more affordable for small businesses at risk of displacement or kind of lowers the cost for businesses interested in renovating or upgrading um, their equipment and space to help with you know growth and, and revenue. And so that's um, providing some new opportunities for small businesses. It also lets us help uh, retain. So some of the retention goals that were flagged as well as helping businesses is going to new spaces to grow. I think someone mentioned previously the new construction is and construction costs in general are just un, un, unreachable for a lot of our small businesses. So trying to really focus on that and um, took a lot of learnings from the first round that we did and um, kind of reimagined the program and restructured it into these different tracks to support businesses uh, at different points along their tenant improvement process. So we're continually learning, um, trying to you know figure out how to support businesses along the way. Next slide. And the one other thing I wanted to touch on quickly before we go into the um, the business community ownership fund is access to capital has been just a huge priority for every small business that um, that we work with. And so we launched the capital access program again in the pandemic with ARPA funds. Uh, to really look at how do we make capital more affordable, recognizing that there are a lot of racial and systemic barriers, uh, I'm sorry, racial disparities and systemic barriers in accessing capital, and uh, was able to write down the principle for the small business flex fund loan at the at the state of Washington, small business recovery loan. Um, and you know, 295 businesses, I think it was 6.9 million, ultimately leveraging 27 million in low interest um, recovery loans for small businesses, the majority of whom were BIPOC or women owned businesses. Uh, next slide. And we've continued to expand this program and evolve it and now have a couple of key strategies here that we're focusing on not just that that uh, loan subsidy, but really understanding the need for support around capital readiness. And so launched the Capital Readiness Support Program this year, where we are working with a cohort of community-based partners to develop new program strategies to help businesses um, just with that education and support process to understand what financing looks like, what, do finance, what is the financing they need for their business, and then how would they get ready to access that financing. And then um, also working with our community lenders, um, particularly our local community development financial institutions to strengthen their capacity and ability to better serve um, kind of our historically marginalized small businesses and provide more support and different options along the way. Next slide. And just wanted to flag, I won't go into detail on here, but we've been really supporting and building out um, kind of our, our small business support systems um, here in Seattle and obviously as part of the region as well. And so looking at different kinds of support from consulting services, one-on-one -on -one supports to kind of more robust business development programs that might be application-based and also looking at different place-based and neighborhood investments. Um, and just making sure, I think uh, language access is really important for all of our programs. We work in partnership with our neighborhood business districts for outreach um, and really trying to make those as accessible and inclusive as possible. Next slide. And then I wanted to flag our, there's a lot of work going around, on around the comprehensive plan update with my colleagues, the Office of Planning and Community Development are leading that. And there's been a focus on building in anti-displacement strategies into that work. And so really a piece of this is exploring strategies to just really increase the city's efforts to prevent displacement and also think about different 
um, kind of component elements of displacement from physical, economic, commercial, and cultural. And so uh, a lot of work going on thinking through what are some of those strategies now, what are some that we want to grow, and kind of what's needed in those different elements. Next slide. And so I'll be, I'll hand it over to Tony in a second. So the Business Community Ownership Fund is a new investment model that we're piloting here in Seattle uh, for ownership of commercial space. So we're partnering directly with Grow America. Um, and the aim here and what's really a priority for the city is really addressing commercial displacement, empowering small businesses with long-term affordability and ownership of their commercial spaces to keep them rooted in Seattle neighborhoods. And, and as I mentioned previously, also uh, creating a pathway for some businesses to return to neighborhoods when they have been displaced. Um, and so this is really part of our goal and effort to think about building you know, long-term vibrant and equitable communities. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Tony, who's gonna walk you through kind of how this works and uh, kind of where we're at. So Tony, go ahead. Thanks, Heidi. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. As Heidi mentioned, my name is Tony Estinet, and I am a program manager with Grow America. So um, also, as Heidi mentioned, the BCO Fund aims to address commercial displacement um, by helping to either return businesses that have been displaced or to help keep businesses rooted in their neighborhoods of choice in Seattle. And this program represents one solution to the national issue of business displacement. Um, and it is a program that can be implemented as part of a broader TOD solution, but it is not explicitly a TOD strategy. In addition to addressing displacement, this program is a wealth creation strategy. Business owners have been facing increasing commercial rents over time. This is not a surprise, but it is a serious concern for business owners. In a recent study of LA small business owners, 65% of those businesses surveyed in a majority Black neighborhood cited rising rent, rents as their primary concern. In the same study, a majority of those interested in commercial real estate ownership cited stability as the biggest potential benefit. The BCO Fund provides that stability by stabilizing rent long term, as you can see by that, that pink bar there. Um, therefore, by not paying these rent increases and knowing what to budget for, the business can put that extra revenue back into their business. Uh, this is a very fun video um, that we don't have time to play today. I'll make sure to add the link to this video into the chat. You can also scan the QR code to access it, and it will be part of like hyperlinked in the um, slides that PSRC shares. So how the fund works, uh, the city of Seattle contributes 50% of the project cost and Grow America matches the 50% with financing to create the BCO fund. Business owners then partner with the BCO fund and form a real estate partnership or an LLC. It might be one business or multiple businesses depending on kind of the overall project. Um, the fund then purchases ground floor commercial space in a mixed use building in one of the neighborhoods that Heidi mentioned. Uh, the business owners own the commercial space as part of the real estate partnership, and the business leases the space from the LLC. Rents are at or slightly below market, and the lease payments remain stable for 30 years through a covenant placed on the building. The BCO Fund's stable costs mean a small business can remain rooted in their community of choice, the neighborhood retains its local character, and the business owners can focus on business development. Grow America stays in the partnership as the managing member, as you see in yellow there. In this role, we manage any required tenant improvements and have an ongoing role with property management and decision-making related to the commercial space. For example, if a business owner wants to relocate their business and exit the partnership, we'd work with the city of Seattle and surrounding community to identify a new business to take its place. Uh, separately, Grow America works with the business owner on any working capital financing needs through one of our two CDFIs, which is a community development financial institution. And I am going to turn it back over to Heidi to discuss the benefits to the business owners and some current projects. 
Hey, thanks, Tony. So just to add, I think we've talked about some of the stability there. Um, I think I really one thing that is really important here, too, is also creating. Um, so it's so really wrapping around those supports, making sure the business is has the working capital needs that they have, uh, really investing in that business as the wealth generating strategy um, by taking the by making the real estate stable. Um, so we're seeing already with our two pilot pro projects that we'll talk about in a minute, just this real community of support with other business owners and a real desire to um, to connect and support each other and identify other businesses and projects there. It's, it can be very um, challenging, as we all know, as a small business owner kind of uh, working in your space. And so having that connection in these neighborhoods and just a really um, important connection with the community as well. Um, one of the things um, I think, um, Phil, I think you mentioned the, the gift of public funds. So one way that we're addressing that is through this project, the city is actually purchasing public benefits. And so we do a lot of work with the business owner to identify what those benefits are are and what the value of those are. So the value is actually equal to what the city invests in the project. And that includes things like um, permanent local jobs, kind of similar to the federal CDBG public benefit, um, community events, um, in-kind services, such as mentoring, workshops, um, food, uh, community meals, things like that. And so we actually, um, create uh you know a document and agreement about that and they report on it annually and so there's a lot of benefits that flow through these projects as well that we're tracking uh, next slide and we've actually um like i said this is new <laughs> so we've completed uh, two pilot projects which we are really really excited about um the first one was la union studio at um the Maddox in the Mount Baker neighborhood, which is which is actually a TOD site right along the light rail there. This was op this was uh, opened in March of this year, and you see Sonia and Sergio there, the owners. This is allowing them to grow their business. They were previously, I think, in their house, um, and from him, we knew that we wanted to stay in Seattle long term. So the longevity of the deal was super appealing to us. And then the second project just opened two weeks ago, actually, uh, Marjorie, which is a restaurant uh, relocated into Seattle's historically African-American neighborhood, the Central District. Um, and from Donna, Donna, I'm no longer anxious about rent increases or unreasonable landlords, and I'm free from the insecurity that comes from being a renter in an expensive and volatile city. Um, so she's really sees this as, you know, she's a real anchor in that community as well. Next slide. See the... So you can see the photo there and our headline. <laughs> and I think they officially opened this weekend. So definitely go check that out. But again, really just want to emphasize the community connections with these projects. We're working with individual business owners, but these projects are really anchored in the neighborhood. They're done in partnership with our community partners um, and are really um, part of that that community system in the neighborhood through through the benefits, through where they're located, and through the partnerships that go around making these successful. Next slide. And Tony. Great. Um, so we are continuing to vet other projects in Seattle, as well as other cities in Washington State and even outside of Washington. Um, as this session is focused on TOD, I wanted to highlight two TOD-related projects that are in our pipeline. Uh, these are really great examples of how the BCO fund can be a reaction to the commercial displacement that can be caused by TOD and how the BCO fund can be an opportunity for displaced businesses by securing that space for a business long term in a new TOD project or a new building. Uh, so the first is a partnership with the Nitsi Stegen, which is a for profit developer. They're building a light, or excuse me, a mixed use affordable housing development near Othello's light rail station that will open in 2026. There has been significant development around this light rail station, and some of that development is displacing businesses, including a local coffee shop and gathering space, Cafe Red. So Cafe Red is going to relocate to two ground floor units in Nancy Stegan's new development, which is about two blocks from its current location. And we're continuing our due diligence and pre-development conversations with both Nitsi Stegan and Kathy Red, uh, but feel that this would be a really good fit for the BCO fund. The second upcoming TOD project is another partnership with Mount Baker Housing. 
Um, as with their Maddox building, this development is going to be another mixed use affordable housing development near transit. In this case, we are working with a small spring rural wholesaler that is being displaced. And by partnering with the BCO fund and Mount Baker Housing, the business owner can grow their wholesale business and open a restaurant to serve the growing community. I know that I'm coming up against time, so I kind of will breeze through this last slide here, really focused more on the lessons learned opportunity. Um, this is not going to be a surprise, but cost is a very big challenge for this program. It is expensive, but it's not impossible. Uh, we're currently estimating capital needs for initial projects in the range of 1.6 to 2.5 million. And this is the combined cost of acquisition, tenant improvements, reserves, transaction costs, legal fees. Um, it really does all add up. Notably, this concept could be less expensive in a city with a lower construction and acquisition costs. Um, so far, each project has been unique. This is both a challenge and an opportunity. Um, it is a challenge as it does not allow for a one-size-fits-all opportunity, um, but as we are still in the pilot phase, this is really allowing us to think through some problem solving and find a great solution that can try to maximize and fit as many options as possible. A business selection is important. Um, where the business is matters and also what the business is matters. Uh, we want to make sure that the space works for the business. BCO Fund is not a good solution if the space itself is not good to begin with. And we also want to make sure that the business is a good match for the community and neighborhood. Clearly, a key priority for this program is to help businesses remain or return to their neighborhood of choice. So making sure that that does make sense for that business is a really big driving factor for us. Um, timing is key. Getting involved as early as possible in a project can help to alleviate a lot of future issues. Um, it can also help to lower the cost of design. For instance, if we knew a restaurant was going into that space, we would want to make sure to add a hood as early as possible. Um, and if the building is already complete, we can work with um, contractors or consultants to get a conditions assessment to see about negotiating a price for acquisition. Uh, length of time it takes is also proving to be a challenge in terms of timing being an issue um, between the legal back and forth and the design and the construction and vetting the purchase and vetting the project. It is taking a little bit longer than we had anticipated. We're continuing to brainstorm how to expedite that process, but it is something that we're considering. And um, finally, there is a lot of technical complexity with the program, which can be challenging for small business owners and community partners who might have less experience with real estate finance or taxes. Uh, but we really think of our these business owners as partners and as um, proponents for this program. So business owners from the program, they really understand and value the importance of stability and control of their space, even if they're not realizing appreciation through real estate. And so it's our hope that these business owners can help to educate their peers on the value of this opportunity for other businesses. Um, with future opportunities, that list is pretty self-explanatory and I am very much at time. So feel free to peruse on your own. Um, but I did definitely want to thank you for the opportunity um, to, to speak, and I'll turn it back over to Katie. Great. Thank you so much, Tony and Heidi. That was wonderful. We are having some excitement in the Q&A about Marjorie uh, moving to this new location, so people are excited about that. And maybe while the City of Austin starts sharing their slides, there was a quick question um, Heidi, just about using the community development block grant dollars in the tenant improvement program that you had mentioned. So just curious if, you know, very quickly, we could talk about any challenges you had using that. And I'm happy to always talk to folks offline. The um, CDBG is a challenging fund source in general. Just there's a lot of requirements and documentation. So for us, just the amount of time to kind of get it through our stuff, um, the prevailing wage um, factors, um, were challenges, but not impossible. So we've actually brought on a consultant to help us and so provide additional support to business owners around prevailing wage. And just getting those budgets, we found most of the budgets under under um, estimated what the actual cost was. So we were spending more time now on these larger build out projects, doing a lot more work at the front end to make sure we've got accurate bids and that folks are aware and educated around some of those prevailing wage requirements. And sometimes just the because there's a jobs created public benefit. And so just making sure the jobs created matches uh, the investment that we're doing. Yeah. Thanks. Great. 
Yeah, thanks for that answer, Heidi. All right, we'll turn it over to Warner and Donald to bring us home. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, good morning for all of y'all on the West Coast, and it's already afternoon here in sunny Austin, Texas. Um, my name is Warner Cook, and I'm the principal planner in the city of Austin's planning department, working on the city's part to make equitable TOD a reality in our community. And um, I'm here today with Donald Jackson, uh, my partner in the economic development department, who's going to kick us off to give you all a little context about the city of Austin's um, commercial context. Um, and then I'll go over our kind of transit system and our approach to TOD policy. And then we're gonna do two kind of case study highlights, um, one from a zoning example and one from more of a tax incentive financial example. So. Hey, good after, uh, good, good morning to y'all on the West Coast. Uh, as, uh, as Warner said, already afternoon here. But uh, yeah, my name is Don Jackson. I'm with the City of Boston's Economic Development Department, and I work in our place-based economic development and incentives uh, programs. Just as an overview, I think we're, our, our small businesses are facing a lot of similar constraints and concerns that, uh, that are in other cities and, and probably similar to the Seattle area. Uh, we have a we have a m most of our sort of brick and mortar small business uh, as well as creative spaces uh, depend on the real the retail real estate sector, and while vacancy for office is is quite high at the moment, vacancy in retail is extremely low, one of the lowest in the nation according to CoStar. Uh, we're it's ho been hovering around three percent for the past several years. Uh, I included a quote from a very recent quote from CoStar here about the. Uh, the difficulty of uh, finding space and, and and finding affordable space in Austin. We also are showing um, a slowdown in new construction and the construction pipeline uh, for uh, retail starts. So that that scarcity problem isn't really isn't really improving uh, anytime in the immediate future. Uh, next slide. This is especially impactful on some of our more kind of historic and uh, walkable. Uh, commercial districts. A lot of these are older buildings. Some of them are tied to uh, former uh, streetcar communities. Uh, so they have a, older buildings with walkable density and often pretty uh, well-developed sidewalk infrastructure. Uh, I've included three here that are most impacted by, well, uh, Warner's included three. We we included three here that are <laughs> most impacted by uh, some of this that are, that are also overlap with our um, uh, incoming uh, light rail lines. Uh, but two of the ones that uh, my department works with quite often are South Congress and South First Street. Uh, if anyone ever visits Austin, these are likely the uh, prime prime spots to visit to see some of our local business culture. Uh, over 100 businesses on one, 85 on another. Um, I'm, uh, I included the average uh, retail rents that they're experiencing in these districts. This is not actually so, which is the, the sort of formal. Uh, information to be getting from CoStar. Anecdotally, I know from from working with the businesses on some of these districts that uh, they're basically playing, paying that base rent plus an additional hundred or hundred and fifty dollars per square foot on top. So they're paying uh, very much downtown level rents at some of the highest uh, commercial rents in the city. Um, Standard being reported is $150 a square foot on South Congress. We're starting to see similar things in South First. Uh, a lot of these, uh, the drag here is also one of our uh, long-term uh, retail corridors that mostly serves the UT campus because it's 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 based on a student market. It has its own sort of issues with precarity based on losing a lot of customer base for several months out of the year. But in all of these districts, uh, we're, we're seeing a lot of pressure on uh, legacy businesses, longtime businesses, uh, small local businesses and creative spaces. We've seen a lot of turnover, um, a lot of uh, a lot of forced relocation based on rent increases uh, to other parts of the city uh, from some of those businesses, a lot of a lot of closures and replacements with national chains. So that is that's the context we're sort of operating in now. And now add to that, that we don't have high capacity transit operating in any of these small business districts yet, and we're about to. Um, so they're already facing this kind of displacement and retention challenge. Um, and now the city is planning to make a generational investment in our transit system right through some of these um, districts that Don just went over. So 
just quickly backtracking, we have briefly done some TOD work in the city of Austin, but it was really focused on one commuter rail station, very kind of small scale boutique regulations, no necessarily like specific um, economic development plans tied to those kind of TOD zoning regulations. Um, and we've seen on the residential side, those, those neighborhoods changing a lot. And even in the, um, even in the case of Plaza Saltillo, which is one of our TODs today, we where that really was like an existing rail yard that was turned into a TOD. Um, so not any direct displacement of businesses. What we've heard, especially from uh, community members over the years is the kind of cultural displacement. So, you know, one of the earlier uh, presenters mentioned that the, the feeling that like, yeah, I'm still here, but where is my culture? And that's something that's definitely um, been happening here in Austin as well, that businesses are losing access to their consumer base as the residential um, character of a neighborhood might change, even if the business is able to maintain. Um, so this is the um, transit system. It includes, like I said, a new light rail transit. So that was through the heart of kind of downtown north south and up east towards our airport. Um, as well as two um, upgrades to our existing commuter rail, the red line, and a new commuter rail line, the green line, and then four rapid bus routes. Um, really key in this proposal was also $300 million that the voters approved at the same time as the transit investment that goes directly towards anti-displacement funding. Um, but so far, the majority of that is, is really planned to target residential displacement pressure along the transit line. Um, things like land banking and buying and preserving existing multifamily units. Um, so it's really been residentially focused and there's a big concern um, that our businesses that are already in such a precarious place are not gonna be able to uh, survive the construction and um, the ultimate you know, likely rise in rents in these areas. So um, what we're trying to do with our approach to TOD planning in the city of Austin is to really move beyond traditional market-based, um, you know, density kind of approaches to TOD, and really also move beyond beyond just a do no harm or a harm mitigation mindset um, to create economic opportunities and benefits for those existing residents and businesses in the neighborhoods themselves. So not just keep them there, but actually help them grow and thrive. And so you'll see throughout if you go check out our policy plan that kind of goes through how we're doing ETOD, that we're really focused on that getting to equitable outcomes. And, and, and especially we have a section on how we're working with small businesses and workforce development to train people to join those different sectors. Um, but you see it in our six goals for ETOD. And so some of the ones that you know we heard from our community as we were developing this policy was really focused on access to high quality jobs, not just the cost of housing being difficult, but the cost of um, either running a business or being an employee and having to commute from far outside the city um, and looking for low educational opportunity jobs that were still high quality. And then cultural and economic diversity, like I meant, the cultural dis displacement in Austin has already been felt for several decades now, especially with our uh, black and Hispanic communities uh, being priced out. And so trying to bring those back and maintain that cultural diversity near our transit is key. Um, so what are we doing on a regulation side to try to meet all of these goals and address the existing and future challenges that our businesses are facing? And one of those being the space challenge that Don mentioned, um, just the really lack of retail space coming online or coming available, turning over in our city. Um, and then another challenge that we've heard from businesses is how to support them during redevelopment, either during the construction of the transit project itself, but also during redevelopment, maybe when they know that they can come back to a site or a space, um, what can they do in the meantime? So in, earlier this year, the city of Austin took uh, our one of our first attempts at, at solving some of these problems with a new program in Texas. We well, in Austin, we don't have uh, mixed use everywhere. Like we heard from the city of Redmond earlier, we have very kind of standard zoning based districts. Um, and we also can't 
require developers to provide community benefits or be involved in any kind of community benefits agreements. So what we do is offer density bonus programs. One of those, um, that's one of the tools we do have. Um, and it's typically targeted towards affordable housing, um, you know, asking for affordable housing units in exchange for offering additional kind of development entitlements. Um, but one of the new things that we are kind of trying with the ETOD bonus program <clears throat> is to really start looking at beyond just housing and, and how we can help retain those existing businesses. Um, this new zoning overlay, uh, which you can see like where it applies in the map, this is kind of the University of Texas drag area, the north end of the first phase of our light rail, and then the South Congress and South First business districts on the south side of Lady Bird Lake are kind of right within the half mile radius of the south end of our alignment. And um, council directed us to apply this bonus program just to multifamily and commercial properties. So we're incentivizing the redevelopment of these properties. We know that um, because we're not applying it to all the, the property in this area. And these are some of our most cherished business districts. So we really wanted to proactively think about what additional things we could add into this bonus program to help mitigate any of that additional pressure. Um, so one of the things that council asked us to do was to restrict non-transit supportive land uses. Um, and this is for all property. You, you don't have to take advantage of the voluntary bonus program. You have to comply with these regulations. Um, and so one of the concerns we heard from business owners was the idea that, you know, oh, if my business use is restricted going forward because it's maybe not, maybe it's auto oriented or it's more wholesale or not customer facing, you know, what is that going to mean? And so we made sure to make sure that those businesses would be able to continue. It's just that new ones couldn't locate in the area. And they can also, um, new businesses can still have those uses as accessory uses as well. So trying to help just even in that restriction of land use, keep um, things stable and even allow for expansion in some cases of those existing, even non-transit supportive uses. Um, and then the really big thing that we did on the zoning side was that in, in this bonus program, instead of just offering additional height for income restricted housing, uh, the developer also has to include support such as uh, relocation benefits and right of first refusal to the existing non-residential tenants um, that meet kind of our community's goals. And so those priority legacy and small businesses for us look like um, adult care and child care services, creative spaces like theaters, um, recording studios, you know, artist maker space cocktail lounges, which is what most of our music venues kind of fall under today. And we're the live music capital of the world. And so these are some of our most iconic businesses that we really want to retain. And then looking at small format retail, um, general retail services, kind of personal services, restaurants, um, and food sales. Uh, there's a big concern about losing out on access to uh, affordable, culturally relevant food in the city of Austin. So if you're one of those businesses and somebody wants to use the bonus program to redevelop the space that you lease, you not only get notified about the redevelopment very early, which you might not usually get, um, but the developer has to create the same or comparable sized space um, in the new development that they're putting on that site. And they have to offer you the first chance to lease that new space. And in the meantime, they also allow businesses to have um, the six month relocation benefit payment. So about six months average of your business's rent um, to help you establish yourself in the meantime during that redevelopment of the site. As we know that kind of reestablishing in a new place is one of the, the main areas that small businesses tend to not uh, come back from is that forced relocation. So that's all great, but it doesn't really talk about the price of operating the business and, and the space um, that they come back to. So uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Don to talk about the financial incentives that we've paired with this zoning overlay to help those businesses be able to afford to operate into the future. Thanks very much. Uh, yes, and I'll be talking about a program we uh, that recently passed uh, um, 
uh, through our city council and that we'll be implementing in the spring. But this is essentially uh, an incentive program to support uh, affordable uh, commercial space for creative spaces and local legacy businesses and similar types of uh, public facing small businesses. Uh, the name of the program is Place-Based Enhancement. Uh, the background of this is, is within Texas, uh, our tax incentive program for economic activities falls under uh, state government code chapter 380. Uh, we went through our, my department, the economic development department went through an extensive uh, revision of that policy for the city uh, back in 2018 uh, with hundreds of attendees, thousands of comments. One of the things that really elevated in the course of those in the, in the course of those conversations was affordability and the affordability of space. That was a top concern for a lot of our uh, businesses and nonprofits operating in the creative sector, as well as small businesses generally. So we in, in 2018 we initially adopted uh, some changes to our existing incentive program, but then we were also instructed by city council to begin development of a program focused specifically on commercial affordability for tenants of commercial space with a focus on small local heritage businesses, nonprofits, co-ops, and the cooperative sector, uh, and the delivery of good services and transportation solutions to underinvested areas that yield benefits to the community. And, and that's essentially what we've what we've done. Um, there, there was, this took a while. Uh, we were held up uh, by that that thing that happened back in 2020. Uh, similar to other cities, a lot of uh, a lot of our department's activity was sort of uh, delayed or re reoriented to supporting uh, thousands of small businesses and creative uh, folks during during the pandemic using some of our government or some of our federal funding. But um, to develop the program, we undertook a with a consultant study uh, and did a lot of stakeholder groups with, with the folks that are listed here, folks from our uh, arts and creative space development community, folks from our business uh, districts and business associations community, folks from the real estate community, local lenders that have a focus on those types of activities. Uh, and we've been presenting this program through uh, for additional for support through a variety of commissions and uh, development and small business uh, councils throughout the city to gain their support as well. The basic framework of this uh, program, uh, it, well, the basic focus of this, as I said, is to support, uh, incur uh, support and encourage affordable commercial space for the creative sector, for small local businesses, community serving projects, and needed infrastructure in underserved areas. Uh, there's most of the categories, most of the ways this incentive can be utilized requires new construction. So we're going to be focusing on uh, the increment of new construction, either from uh, new buildings or from tenant improvements or, or site remodels. Uh, we There's one uh, category in our program that can actually just support existing venues, creative spaces, and legacy businesses. Uh, that are threatened by high real estate costs uh, that does not require new uh, construction investment. It's limited because that's coming more out of our general fund as uh, our current general fund uh, program instead of um, uh, increments of increments of taxation based on new development. The primary community benefit this program will really focus on is again affordable space. Uh, there'll be additional community benefits that will be tied to those. Um, that'll help uh, in terms of scoring and prioritization for different programs or for different uh, projects. The categories we have in this, uh, I'll just give a very quick overview, but the first category is really kind of that big one that's going to, I think, have the most impact in our ETOD areas. Uh, it's just, and, and essentially it is using tax reimbursements on that increment of new development to developers of mixed use and commercial uh, building projects and targeted areas that uh, that provide affordable com uh, commercial leases for music venues and local small businesses and community development projects in their spaces. So uh, in that ETOD areas, in those ETOD areas that Warner was talking about, uh, that is one of the target areas we want to apply this program. Um, we can, along with just the general, along with the uh, sort of protection for existing small businesses, we can, uh, uh, layer onto that this tax incentive that essentially uh, is meant to fill any gap created for the project by offering uh, affordable leases to creative spaces or small or local small businesses, uh, and 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 make that feasible for those uh, for those developments, uh, with additional points for basically bringing in uh, bringing in the any folks that might have been displaced from initial construction. 
So that will be that will be the main the main program that will be relevant for that. There's a few other programs uh, as part of this. Uh, co uh, community impact is the second category is uh, can support just tenant improvements more generally, or and uh, just gap financing for projects uh, that are owned by their operators. So if a small business already owns their property, for example, we can help support them with facade improvements or tenant improvements through that. Uh, but this category three is the one uh, cultural preservation. This is the one that can just support existing venues or local small uh, local legacy businesses. We're, we're making the parameters for that one fairly strict. So creative spaces or legacy businesses, which we define as 20 years old or more with a, a public facing brick and mortar business uh, just to limit budgetary uh, concerns. And then category four, which is a little bit different, but and that's that's just a flexible ver uh, category that can be utilized for just major initiatives that are city driven. We have a lot of uh, major properties that the city or or its ancillary um, development corporations uh, or repurpose into mixed use projects. So this can just help that help those types of activities. But the really big ones for, for especially for that that UTOD framework is that affordable space. Um, as I mentioned, uh, for our target areas, one of the big ones, uh, ETOD, DBOT areas, uh, also focusing on areas where the city is leading uh, major redevelopments. Um, we also have areas that are identified as priority equity areas uh, in, in some anti-displacement studies that have been they're done in association with the light rail. And they're ones where we want to make sure that we can help uh, target support for um, mitigating any displacement pressure or helping getting uh, long-time businesses reestablished in those areas, and then also just our economic and cultural districts. Um, so, uh, yeah, next slide. So, as an example here, um, this is just a commercial affordability example that, again, is tied to the ETOD. This is, there is no such thing as the Grackle Development Company. Just This is totally hypothetical. We used for our council descriptions. But essentially, it's it's a gap financing model. So we can use the total value of the project uh, as the base for the incentive. And for the incentive, we can use reimbursements of city the city of Boston increment of property tax uh, and potentially sales tax. Uh, we do not, Texas doesn't have a state income tax. So, and the city of Austin definitely doesn't have a state, have an income tax. So we can't reimburse anything with that. But uh, we do have an incremental property tax that we can utilize as the base. So in this case, uh, we would be providing um, some gap financing to help support uh, an affordable lease for 10 years for a, uh, for a creative space in a mixed use building uh, with an annual rent escalation maximum uh, and a target uh, rate of rent at 50% of market rate. And that is that is our goal for this incentive, this kind of pretty, uh, pretty high levels of affordability uh, relative to market at least. Uh, a lot of that is because a lot of the folks that we really are getting a lot of need for this from uh, are creative spaces and music venues. Uh, Austin is the live music capital of the world and we have a large arts community and we're uh, it's it's we've been we've been running on that brand for a while, so we like to make sure we can keep it. Uh, but a lot of those are much lower margin than other types of businesses. Uh, even uh, a lot, as, as Warner said, most of our existing uh, music venues are uh, are listed as uh, technically cocktail lounges. Uh, the difference being uh, because they have substantially more investment in music infrastructure than than just a just a just a standard cocktail lounge with stages audience areas screen rooms sound equipment and everything their their margins are much thinner uh, so we want to make sure we can help try and support them with uh, business retention and affordability as as we can mm, that's it thank you all and as always feel free to reach out to either of us um and Thank you to Puget Sound Regional Council and the other presenters, because I learned some new things about what your region is doing today, too. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Warner and Donald. Yeah, I want to echo Warner and just say a big thank you to all of our panelists. We've had a lot of really interesting and in-depth discussions, and we will be sending those slides around for all of the attendees to take a look at. So for now, I'll ask the presenters to turn their cameras back on if possible, and we have a couple minutes here for some Q&A. Um, one of the big questions, and we saw this when people were asking questions ahead of the webinar, and this also came up during the webinar, but there's a lot of interest. We have jurisdictions of all sizes that are on this call. So wondering for some recommendations on um, 
first steps, especially for smaller jurisdictions that have fewer resources than the three wonderful cities uh, we have on the call today, and maybe any recommendations on where you would focus efforts on addressing business displacement first. I can jump in first, and again, I apologize, my camera's not working today, but yeah. one of the things that Philly and I and our team have been really looking at is just what are the creative opportunities that we can come up with using just tweaks to existing code or policies uh, or programs or just adding new conversations, right? Um, and so I would encourage you to just take a look and see uh, if there are some of those creative solutions. Uh, the, for instance, um, we started talking on a regular basis together and just having that space to talk regularly helped identify opportunities for how we could do matchmaking and, and identifying early which spaces are going to be redeveloped and, and having the conversations with those businesses to identify their needs. We've the conversations about how we can change our code to allow businesses to go into places that the underlying code doesn't allow right now through that um, accessory business uh, code update that we're doing. Um, all of those things are just micro changes um, that we've been able to identify that address very specific needs. But honestly, it just came by creating a conversations that happened on a regular basis with a number of different people, um, including our public right-of-way management team, right? So how can we reuse our, our right-of-way spaces? Um, so. Great. Heidi, you have something yeah, to add? I'll, I'll just add to that. I, I, that's a, I agree with all that. And I think, um, obviously, Seattle, I'm trying to think of not like in a different context a little bit, but I think, um, we're doing a lot around just on that that theme of having a lot of conversations and just kind of understanding and bringing folks together that may not always be talking to each other. And I'm thinking like around Seattle Restored, where we're really looking at vacant spaces and engaging with folks and finding those win-wins where um, we can have a little more flexibility in terms of leasing um, for shared goals around activation or creating opportunities. Um, so there's, I think we'll be doing more work in that space actually in the coming years is, is building those those relationships and kind of identifying where, creating those spaces where those conversations can happen on a more ongoing basis. Um, we're also seeing a lot around like change of use. And so looking at some of the permitting pieces and partnering with our Seattle Department of Construction and Inspections to see where um, we can kind of streamline some of that. We have a small business liaison in that department. That's been a really great partner to think through some of those and try to expedite some of our small small business projects. Um, and then finally, just um, we're, we've also been doing some consulting support around commercial leases. So in a lot of education around commercial leases, which is a very specific piece, but a lot of businesses um, may be in leases that aren't favorable or may not know how to negotiate or what can be negotiated. And so we've been building in some consulting support and working in partnership with our neighborhoods as well to identify those. So I'll just flag a couple of things there. Great. Yeah, thanks so much, Heidi. Okay, I think we only have time for one more quick question, unfortunately, but this, again, this was another one that came up a lot um, in registration, and it, it has to do with people asking about ways to both preserve our commercial spaces without sacrificing housing and housing density. So I already heard a lot of interesting things really from all three of you about this, but maybe if any of you wanted to speak to kind of the, the potential conflict in ways to avoid, um, you know, our, our hope for more affordable housing and commercial uh, preservation. You know, just as, and I can respond very quickly about about this from our from our angle and our department's angle. I think that's something we've been very um, interested in at the at the city for some time. Definitely in my department because we, you know, we are the economic development department. We want to we want our city to be prosperous. We want our city to have adequate housing for its workforce and for 
the folks who need it. And we definitely want need and Austin definitely needs a lot of affordable housing, but some of the best areas to, to concentrate that on our corridors from a, from a planning perspective also have those, those small walkable um, uh, commercial districts that, that we were talking about. So that's really one of the things that guided our, our incentive framework. And it's something we've been kind of thinking about for a long time in my, in my office, we've been working on it for a while, just how do we, uh, how do we encourage redevelopment that 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 builds the capacity we need uh, without displacement? So and 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 we'll we'll see how how it works out in terms of the tool set we've got now, based on just initial responses from different developers and small businesses. I think we'll be able to actually provide some some good options for folks to so that so that instead of you know the, instead of uh, small business preservation being uh, in conflict with like new development for housing, they they work together because you know ultimately the thing we want to preserve isn't necessarily the building. It's it's the people, it's the businesses, it's the relationships, it's the culture, and and honestly having uh, a few hundred uh, tenants living above your business is not a bad way to get a customer base. So these are there. There doesn't have to be a conflict there. It just requires creative solutions to kind of work through some of those. Um, uh, and, and, and bring together those countervailing needs. Great. Thanks so much, Donald. Okay, unfortunately, we are almost at time, so I'm just going to quickly wrap up with one more um, plug for that upcoming University of Washington event and then for our next toolbox session, which will be taking place on February 7th. And a little more information about the promised AICP credit. If you are interested, you can find more information, of course, on the AICP um, dashboard and use this information. And I'll ask Michaela to launch our final poll question, which is just a quick survey about your thoughts on today's webinar. Um, yeah, really want to thank the great attendance we had today. Appreciated everybody making the time. A huge thank you to all of our panelists. We will be sending around their detailed presentations so you can dive into the code on your own. Um, yeah, but really thank you everybody for, for stopping by today and I hope you have a great rest of your Friday. Thanks.